Okay, welcome to session 12. We're almost there, this one and then the next time we're together. In session 12, I think that James is gonna really minister to our souls in ways that I don't think get talked about enough. So uh, throughout Christian history, it's been called different things. It's been called the desert. It's been called the dark night of the soul. There are these different phrases and words about these seasons in which we feel dry and wrung out and worn out. Uh, and, and James is gonna encourage us that in that season, and maybe, uh, I've said this to you, maybe you're in that season right now. Maybe you've come here and you're just gasping uh, for spiritual air. Well, I'm hopeful that the Spirit of God tonight will meet you where you are because in this session, James is gonna say, let that dry season lead you not to faithlessness, but let it push you all the more into the Lord via prayer and, and praise and the seeking of his face. We see this throughout the scriptures where, where I mean, you, you are in great company if this is where you are, where King David would say that, how long, O Lord, will you forsake me forever? You, you have Moses saying, hey, show me your glory. You, you've got Jeremiah saying, where have you gone? So you, you're in great company uh, of the saints of old to, to say, come help me, I'm dry and weary. Let's listen to what James has to say in this session. Okay, now why are we in Mark 14 if we're actually supposed to be in James chapter five? Well, I, I found that James five, the text that we'll be in today, was for me extremely difficult as I began to build out the series. And here's why it was difficult. It was difficult simply because of everything that's in there. I, I mean, these just few verses, I feel like I could have done a series, maybe even a 12-week series, just on this text alone. Uh, and so the complexity, or really, all that's in there and all the different ways we could take this text, think of it uh, as a, a diamond that can be turned and seen from different angles, that, that I wanted to um, somehow paint a picture as James starts to land the, the plane on, on what is actually going on here. And so there are a hundred different ways I think this text could be correctly preached, but to frame where I'm going with it, uh, I want to point out this interaction between Jesus and the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter is easily one of the more colorful characters in Christian history, all right? He is brash and aggressive. He tends to not mind to fight, all right? In fact, we see him, he, he's actually, he cut off a guy's ear in one sense, and that he, he is an aggressive man, not afraid of conflict. So if you're nervous about conflict or squeamish about conflict, Peter's on the other side of the scale. He welcomes it. It almost appears at times he's looking for it. He's also a brother that tends to speak before he thinks. Again, you might not be able to relate to any aspect of Peter in regards to those personality traits, but we all share something in common with the Apostle Peter, and that's what I wanna turn your eyes to. Immediately following the Lord's Supper, the institution of the Lord's Supper, um, we see this, Mark 14, starting in verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, love that, he's like, ah, these bums maybe. All right, even though they all fall away. He doesn't say they might, even though they all fall away. I hear you, Jesus, I get it. You're the son of God, they're gonna all fall away. But then Peter does what he so often does. Even though they all fall away, I will not. So Jesus lovingly says to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. So Peter's rebuked by Jesus, right? So, of course, you get rebuked by Jesus, you back off, right? I mean, listen, I'm, I'm backing off. If even a dear friend of mine uh, rebukes me, I, I'll back off a little bit, all right? But, but Jesus just rebuked him, and Peter, this is personality stuff, right? G Peter, even being rebuked by Jesus, doesn't back off. Look what he says next. But he said, look what the text says, emphatically. <laughs> Gosh, I love him. If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And then they all said the same. I love how Peter's confidence actually made a moron out of everybody else. 
Um, one of the things that's gotta be true about the Apostle Peter, he's a leader. We see later on at the church in um, Antioch, you see a, a lot of people being deceived by Peter's hypocrisy. In fact, even uh, Barnabas is swayed by Peter's hypocrisy later on in the New Testament. But look in verse 66. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priests came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. He played dumb, I don't even know what you're talking about. And, and then went out into the gateway and a rooster crowed. Well, what a moment there, the rooster crowed. Surely it registered. We don't see that it registered, but surely that first rooster crow, you think maybe, and this conjecture, I'm gonna leave the Bible, you, you think maybe he heard that and was like, okay, I got this. And because he goes back in. After that, he, he goes outside, here's the rooster crow, and then he heads back in to the courtyard. Look there now in verse 69. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. In one of the other gospels, the Bible tells us that when the rooster crowed the second time, Jesus turned and looked at Peter, if you can imagine. So now Peter is broken, he is weeping, and here's how I'm trying to frame our James text. So far um, in the book of James, here's what we've talked about. So I'm gonna just do the last 12 weeks um, just listing it in sentences, so don't panic. Uh, it, it'll be a regular-sized sermon, okay? So in, so far in the book of James, we, we've talked about um, how to live our lives as servants rather than demanding to be served. Um, we've talked about considering our trials as joy not just hearing the word, but doing the word, not being judgmental, but extending mercy, walking in works that reveal faith, being um, doers of the word and not just hearers, only watching our mouths, pursuing true wisdom rather than false wisdom, pursuing godliness, not worldliness, learning to walk in humility, seeing money rightly. And then last week, we talked about the importance of walking in patience. Now, my guess is that almost every one of those turns, uh, we've said, Yes, Lord, I'm gonna do this, I've got this, I hear yet, I saw that in the text, I want this for my life, and, and we set out to actually apply it. See, the thing we have in common with the Apostle Peter is our will and our discipline and our passion and our strength is lacking to bring about the obedience that God has called us to. That's what we all have in common here. And so uh, I, I contend that out of this beautiful text in James chapter five, in fact, if you wanna go ahead and turn there now, James chapter five, we're gonna start in verse 13. But in this text that's so rich with opportunity to preach on a variety of things, what James, as he's ending the letter, is trying to draw our attention to, is he's trying to give insight into our maturing our relationship with Christ in a way that truly emboldens and empowers that obedience. And so let's read the text. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I'd underline that, maybe circle it. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth 
bore its fruit. So maybe you're listening to this text and you heard my brief outline and you're going, okay, here we go. Hey, here's another kind of, uh, you gotta pray and you gotta sing and you gotta, and, and yes, that's in this text and I believe, yes, that's where I'm going. But here's where I wanna try to take how you're thinking about prayer and praise because I think that all of us know about prayer and praise. I don't think I'm gonna say, hey, we should be praying and blow anyone's mind here at the church. I, I don't think anyone, when you talk about prayer, you talk about praise, goes, I had no idea I was supposed to talk with God and I was supposed to praise his name. I, I think we know, so, so what is it that needs to change in us so we act in? Well, I, I think, honestly, I think the thing that we missed most often is not the invitation to pray and praise, but the invitation to commune with the living God and to boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence. So I, I quoted Colossians 3, 4 several weeks ago. And in Colossians 3, 4, um, the, the writer of Colossians, the apostle Paul says, and when Christ, who is your life, it's this appeal to not break apart our lives into segments, but really have Christ, who is our life. And I taught that when, when it came to money and how we spend our money, that Christ is my life. It's not Christ. Christ and then my marriage. It's Christ and then I operate in my marriage in relation in conjunction with Christ who is my life. The same is true with parenting. The same is true in all areas of my life. And so what's happening there is regardless of what's going on in your life, the invitation is come to Christ. Commune with Christ. Know God. So if you go back and look at the text, you see here that we have a relationship with God. It is doctrinal, but it is also experiential. We have a relationship. It's not just mere intellect. It's a relationship with, a relationship that we've been invited into. And I think if you see prayer and praise that way, it changes it. Prayer is not just a duty. It's a delight and a gift for the people of God to commune with their adopting, loving, merciful Father. And so we see here, are you suffering? Go to him. Are you cheerful? Sing praises about him. Are you sick? Gather with others, particularly the elders, and go to him. It's this, regardless of what's going on, get in here. Now think, do you think about God like that? That, oh, you're suffering? Get in here. Oh, you're happy? Get in here. Oh, you're sick? Get in here. You have this appeal from God. Listen, James is writing, hey, for all that's been said, for all that God has commanded, for as much as I've tied this back to the teachings of Christ, I know you're going to fall short. You know what I want you to keep in mind? Get in here. Commune with the living God. Have a relationship with him. Listen to me. Some weak, sad, Bible Belt version of Christianity that has you thinking because you believe moral principles and attend a church, you're a Christian, is not biblical Christianity. You've been called to a relationship with God through Christ. That and that alone is Christianity. Any other kind of moral construct might be sweet, but it ends in hell. Might be sweet, but it ends in hell. In hell. So then, how should we think about prayer then? So you got this invitation, come to me. Um, here are seven things about prayer that I've, I've found so helpful. Uh, these aren't original to me. I actually first read them from uh, D.A. Carson. And so seven things on prayer that, that I hope are helpful for you. One, I, I think prayer needs to be planned. Prayer needs to be planned. And, and some of you are like, gosh, this just doesn't sound right. Not, I can tell you this, I plan dates with my wife. There's not a human being on earth that I love more than Lauren Chandler. Not one. Not your children. No, those kids are going to get out of my house. My wife's going to be with me till the end. I love my wife more than I love anyone else on earth. And I plan dates. And in that planning, she has never felt robbed of, of my desire for her or love for her. So you have to plan prayer. Like, you know this. We, we've talked about time throughout. We get like, there, there's a, got to get some things done. Busy day tomorrow. Got a lot to do. So you plan it. And, and honestly, I think this idea of planning deserves eventually a sermon of its own out of the Proverbs. So like, if I had to guess, there are a lot of you that you're going to work out this week, right? <laughs> you are. I mean, you've got plans. You're going to hit that elliptical. You're going to Gosh, I don't know what you're going to do. You're going to take a class. You're going to, but unless you actually go, when am I going to do that? Chances are you're not going to do that because there's a thousand competing things that are going to kind of pull on you. There are things that you're going to, in the moment, feel like they're more important. They're more valuable than that. And maybe they are, maybe they're not, but without planning, you're not going to do it. So plan 
prayer. When is it that you will pray? I'm not saying that throughout the day you don't commune with God because I texted with Lauren right before I walked out here. So we have set dates, but then we text and talk throughout the day. How's your day going? How's your day going? What's going on? How can I help you? Hey, you want me to pick that up on you? We're texting all day long, but I think you need to plan it. Number two, adopt practical ways to impede mental drift. So uh, it's gonna be very difficult to pray with your iPhone in front of you and all your apps on. I, I think if we were aware of really the spiritual war that's waging around us, we'd be able to dial in a lot more. If we had any concept of just how violent and bloody things are in the heavenlies, we'd be much more apt to pray. And that pull towards checking our Twitter timeline checking in on Instagram. And listen, just as a life coach, if you're in the midst of deep journaling and Bible study, you probably don't need to Instagram it, right? I mean, it's like, oh, this is so rich. Communing with the Lord. No, you're not. You're Instagramming it, so I know you're not communing with the Lord, because if you're communing with the Lord, the last thing you're thinking is, you know what? Everyone should know this. No, to commune with the Lord is an intimate connection with our creator. To walk in the very thing we were created for, you're not thinking about gramming it at that time. So if that was too close to home, I don't apologize. The third thing is in different times and in different seasons, I have sought out people to pray with. So you wanna call it prayer partners or something like that. Just, I, I wanna pray with people. I, I learn from them and I pray more fervently when I'm with others who will agree with me in prayer. And so, man, you want to grow in prayer? Maybe you gather with somebody to pray. Listen, if you don't know how to pray, I'm telling you, as you leave here today, when you go to home group, here's the question. How many home group leaders? Here's what you have. How many of you don't know how to pray? Feel like you don't know how to pray? And when then those hands go up, you guys need to go, okay, let's get together. Let's start praying together. That's how you'll grow the, the fourth thing is just like the third. Get around people who do pray. Get around people who do pray. Is this not the way you learn everything else? Just get around those who are better than you. Not, not better than you in the spiritual sense, not like varsity, but just got more experience. They've been at it longer. Just get around them. Develop a system for your prayer lists. Develop a system. And if, you're, if, if I lost you at systems, right, you're like not type A at all. So I know when I say system, you know, there are certain ears that perk up and other people that just vomit and black out, right? So uh, in the end here, um, if you're a systems type A person, you're like, yes, a system for prayer. And if you're type B, say, I will never pray again. No, no, I mean something as simple as note cards. So, so the, the system that's very basic is, is I have um, a note card um, for my wife and for my children, and, and I am writing on that card specific prayers I have for them. I share that information with them. I, I, when I cuddle with my kids at night, say, here's how daddy's praying for you. How else can daddy pray for you? Sometimes uh, Nora, my youngest, will want to see her card. It's, it's really kind of a, a cute thing. And, and then I have a card for the elders. I have a card for um, Flower Mound. I have a card for um, my neighborhood. I, and it's just a system. And then I work my way through those cards while I'm exercising the plan for prayer that I have. And if that feels too stuffy and all that for you, I would say, does planning a vacation with your wife away from your children feel stuffy? No. So why are you trying to put that on this? It's just good, disciplined work that should lead to a much strengthened and empowered maturation. Number six, mingle praise, confession, and intercession, and tie as much of it as you can back to the scriptures. Here's what Tim Keller says on prayer. We would never produce the full range of biblical prayer if we were initiating prayer according to our own inner needs and psychology. It can only be produced if we are responding in prayer according to who God is as revealed in the scripture. Some prayers in the Bible are like that of an intimate conversation with a friend. Others like an appeal to a great monarch and others approximate a wrestling match. We must not decide how to pray based on what types of prayer are most effective for producing the experiences and feelings we want. We pray in response to God himself. 
himself. I love this quote because he's tying our prayers to the word of God so that you don't necessarily have to separate those two things out. So as you're reading the word of God, I can come across a sentence and hope and desire and want that for my son. Hope, desire, want that for my own heart. Hope, desire, want that for my daughters. See something about the character of God that hits my heart in a different way and then spontaneously go into praise there. Like, I love the grids that try to teach prayer, but it's a harmful thing, I think, if when all said and done, you're in the scriptures and come across something during your intercession space that should lead your heart to adoration, and you cut off adoration because you're in the intercession block. It's foolish. We read the word of God and let it lead us to praise, lead us to adoration, lead us to intercession. We wanna tie our prayers as best we can back to the word of God. And then number seven, and this is great, ready? Pray until you pray. That's just a great sentence. You wanna learn how to pray? Pray until you pray. So that, that's the prayer block, but he also doesn't want us praying. He's actually got us doing something even more uncomfortable than praying. You're like, what could possibly be more uncomfortable than praying? Singing. Singing praises to God. So why here, when we're joyful, should we sing praise to God? Well, three things on singing praises to God. Singing digs deep roots. In Colossians 3.16, the Bible says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I love hearing my children at our house singing songs that we sing in the corporate gathering. I don't know if you pick up on this, but if we're singing a song, you will almost always at the bottom of our screen see the text from which we wrought that. You are singing doctrine. You are singing biblical theology. Surprise! I'm not a theologian. Really? Why don't you just sing this song for me real quick? Right? And then all of a sudden, you're in the deep, it's take home theology. So we sing together and it digs deep roots. And it's a type of theology that we take home. It's accessible and easy. Like my six-year-old will sing some of the songs that we sing. And my six-year-old's developing a biblical theology, a biblical doctrine of who God is, how he relates to his people in the singing of songs. What a gift. How easy is that? It also builds, it builds others up. Um, if you go to a concert or even in worship service, one of my favorite moments, and, and as I've had conversations with others, many people's favorite moment is when the guy will back off the mic and the congregation or the concert hall will just sing. There's something electric and soul stirring about the voices of many coming together. It builds up the body. And then lastly, it strengthens the person for trials. It strengthens the person for trials. In my more difficult moments in the 40 years that I've been alive and in the 20 years that I've followed the Lord, um, dark nights of the soul have always been made bearable by worship and by singing to the Lord. Um, in one of, the, one of my favorite confrontations in my marriage, right after I had been diagnosed with brain cancer and they were saying, you're gonna die and you got a couple of years left, make sure everything's in order, which is great, you're gonna poison me while I try to get everything in order. And then uh, my wife finally like, pulled me aside and said, I don't know how this ends, but you're gonna have to take those headphones off. Because man, I was, my, my little happy place was worship music blaring in my ears and just preparing to see him face to face. It was in those moments when they strapped my head down to the radiation table and then they closed that giant lead door and left me in there by myself. It, it was songs in my head. In the MRI machine, I'm singing to the Lord. I've got a friend who plays golf. I don't play golf. So he, he literally studies holes and, and he thinks through playing a round of golf in the MRI. I don't do that. I sing. I, I sing in this communing with God via prayer and the singing of praise and all that creates. You also have this, hey, are you sick? Then call the elders together. They're gonna anoint you with oil, which could be medicine there, and I know all of you essential oil are like, that's right, get them, pastor, right? But, but in the end here, um, what you have happening is 
a community that's locked into one another and pursuing him together. So another argument that I will fervently give for the local congregation, for belonging to a local church, is that in moments of suffering and sickness, we pull together. We walk together. We commune with God together. And in this text, he says, call the elders. Call the elders. You don't belong to a local congregation. Who are the elders? Randomly, you just pick elders from a bunch of different churches, have them come. No, the community in which you live, you call the elders together. You give yourself over to the common grace of medicine, if that's what's meant by oil in this text. And then you pray together. And the Bible would tell us in other places, you weep together and then you rejoice together. And you, this is a call to community. But that, that's not the only thing. A, uh, a life of um, prayer and praise, that's not the only piece for maturation. Uh, we also see, look there in verse 15, uh, the ongoing ethics of confession and repentance. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I think one of the big mistakes of our day is this kind of siloing out of life. I said earlier that one of the things we want to do is, okay, I've got my church life, I've got my work life, I've got my home life, I've got my, and really our cry, our banner as Christians is Christ who is our life. He is my life. Now what you see happening here is a type of siloing that the spirit and the body and the mind are somehow so disconnected that they don't affect one another. And, and it's not biblically true. And one of the things I love, and I say this to you as often as I can, I love it when science starts to catch up to the Bible. And, and so we see in this place that, that the Lord has designed us as whole people and that really the spirit can affect the physical and can affect the mental. And, and let, me, let me show you this in another place. In Psalm 32, 3 through 4, it says this. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. There's a gnawing in the pit of his stomach, verse four. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. He couldn't sleep well. And my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. He is exhausted. And then he ends this psalm with Selah. Think about this. Consider this. Don't be too quick to keep reading, keep singing. You think about this. When he kept silent, when David, who, who had some secret sin in his life, when he kept silent about those secrets in his life, his bones, ways he had a gnawing in the pit of his stomach that wouldn't go away, he couldn't sleep at night, and he felt utterly and completely exhausted. Um, on a recent NPR interview with a neuroscientist named Dr. David Eagleman, he, he said this about some of his research. You have competing populations in your brain. One part that wants to tell something and one part that doesn't. There is a real physiological battle going on in the brain. So keeping certain behaviors secret, especially behaviors that are, is seen or understood to be wrong, and I love he's a secular, that's why he put wrong in in parentheses, means continual struggle with yourself. The internal dissonance and lack of sense of personal integrity is draining. The struggle involved in keeping a secret is stressful. This means that your brain will register the fact that there are increased levels of stress hormones going through your bloodstream as a result of this struggle to keep your secret. Your brain does not enjoy this stress. Those living duplicitous lives live with the stress of keeping a whole section of their life secret from the people they see every day and care about. The fact that their brains are marinated in stress hormones due to keeping the secret over and above the effects of the wrongdoing themselves can cause an impairment in the person's ability to stay healthy and function well. So you've got science saying, don't live a duplicitous life. Don't hold on to secrets. Come into the light because confession brings about deeper, more intimate relationships. And by the way, it'll make you a healthier person. Like this is the secular world going, the Bible's right. They just don't know they're saying that, which is one of my favorite parts. It's one of my favorite parts. The Bible's right. Thank you very much. Right, and so here's my appeal to you. If you can feel yourself 
in Psalm 32. You got a gnawing in your gut, having difficulty sleeping at night, feel just exhausted. Stop. From my first second as pastor of this church, I wanted to flank myself with other men and women and keep us before the Lord, especially in this way. Let us not ever pretend to be more than we are. Why? Well, the cost of confession could be severe, that's why. Well, yeah, but you're saying that as though you're not paying a deep price right now for not confessing. Confessing secrets, and maybe, maybe it's uh, an addiction to pornography, maybe it's an eating sore, maybe you're cutting, maybe you're really struggling with depression, maybe you're, I don't know what it is, maybe you're actually flirting or having an affair with somebody at work, maybe I don't know, I, I know that there could be a, a billion things going on across this congregation and across those later who will listen to this. But I'm telling you that the only way to kill darkness is to drag it into the light. You will not win on your own. Now, right now, you can say, surely I will. Well, and you're just being Peter. That's all you're doing in that same kind of false bravado and false kind of notion of strength. Because like, here's the conversation I find myself in all the time. Man, if I ever were to tell my spouse that I look at pornography, this all, she, she would just never forgive me. He would just never forgive me. I, I can beat this. Okay. Now, how long? When did you start looking at pornography? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I was about 13. You're 37. Like, do you realize how stupid you sound to me right now? If you're like, Pastor, did you really? That's stupid. I, I love you. Are you serious? You're literally going, I've been working at it for 20-something years and got nowhere but I got it this time. Look, you don't got it. Look there in 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Now, Elijah's street cred is legit. I mean, he walks in enough power. And we first run into uh, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17 when he stands in front of uh, Ahab, a terrible king married to Jezebel, right? You just, look, just don't marry a woman named Jezebel. Just, just blank it. If we have somebody at the village named Jezebel, I apologize. You should be angry at your parents. Now, uh, when all said and done here, Ahab, this evil king, um, it's already stopped raining for six months in Israel, and Elijah tells Ahab, it's going to be three more years. It's going to be three more years. So Ahab now wants him dead. Jezebel wants him dead. And so he flees to the brook in Cherith. And, and there at the brook in Cherith, um, God takes care of him. The birds feed him. There's water in the brook. And then it all starts to dry up. And Elijah starts to wonder, oh, I wonder if the Lord's forgotten me. Have I done something wrong? He's almost like, oh, no, what did I do? The brook's run. And then the Lord leads him to the widow at Zarephath. And, and so the widow at Zarephath, he, he approaches her. God has sent me here. Uh, please make me something to eat. And her response was, I have just a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil, and a little bit of water, enough to make one cake that my son and I are going to eat so that we can die. So a cheerful woman, if you will, right? Uh, uh, an, op an optimist. And so Elijah says, hey, the Lord sent me here. The Lord will provide. The Lord is good. And sure enough, day after day after day, that same amount of flour, same amount of oil, same amount of water is there. And there's a cake every day for the three of them to eat. And then out of nowhere, the son gets sick and dies. And the widow begins to wonder, is it my sin? And, and surely Elijah, this man of God, is going to step into that space and go, no, the Lord will provide. I'll heal him. And we do see Elijah take the boy and, and bring him back to life. But now before Elijah questions whether or not he has sinned against the Lord and whether that sin was what led to the boy's death. And then you see Elijah on Mount Carmel fighting the prophets of Baal. You see him call fire down out of heaven that consumes not just the sacrifice, but the rocks and the dirt calls fire out of heaven. After this, 
uh, Jezebel hears what happens to her prophets and, and she says, God deal with me harshly if by this time tomorrow you're not like one of those. And so what does our boy Elijah, who has seen such powerful, profound things from God do? He runs and he pouts and he accuses God and he, right? He, I mean, like what? You just called fire out of heaven. Like, can we chat? Like, I just feel like I wouldn't have any questions after that. If God was feeding me with birds, you know, from when there was no food, if he was giving me drink when there was no water, if miraculously there was meal after meal after meal, when everyone else is dying around me, you would think the fire out of heaven would kind of push you over the edge and go, got it, but not Elijah. Elijah's pouting. He's like, I'm the only one that hadn't bowed my knee. Why have you abandoned? He actually asked God, will you let me die? <laughs> Elijah's like, can you just kill me? I mean, I don't know if that's the adrenaline crash from the fire thing, but, but he asked God to kill him. And here's why I like Elijah as the illustration. He's a man with a nature just like ours. Elijah, for the profound ways that God used him, look right at me, certainly did not wear a cape. In the midst of unbelievable miracles, he questioned God. In, in, the, in the middle of unbelievable blessings, he doubted. In the midst of what would really turn, we feel like, we think, I think, that if I had been there to see or been there to experience, that I would like not have these struggles, and yet here he is struggling. And what James is saying, no, 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 cling to the Lord, go to the Lord, know the Lord. It is the Lord who is your righteousness. It is the Lord who accomplishes. And for all of Elijah's goofiness, after this, he, he establishes Elisha as his heir apparent. And then, do you know the next place we see Elijah? The Mount of Transfiguration. He shows up with Jesus on the mountain. Listen, James is beautiful and it's long. We've got a little bit more to go. But really, where our heads and hearts need to be is communing with God on high. That's prayer, that's praise, that's confession. That's repentance. My most earnest prayer for you is always this. You ready? Weariness. That's what I pray for you. And if you're thinking, how cruel. It's not cruel. It might be the most loving prayer I can pray. See, if Peter was weary of himself, he would have made such a ridiculous claim, specifically after Jesus said, no, 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 you're going to all fall away. If, G, if Peter was weary of himself, then after the first rooster crowed, he would have repented and, and all the damage that comes from his other two, I don't know this man, I have no idea who this is, wouldn't have taken place. You being weary, tired enough to surrender pushes you into prayer and praise more than your strength ever will. And, and what does confession do and repentance do? And, I, and I'm not just talking confession before God. I'm saying drag this thing into the light. I'm not just saying that when we're done here, you go, God, you know what I've been doing. You know where I've been. Please forgive me. Yes, now take another step and confess to brothers and sisters who can hold you accountable. Get out of this crazy cycle you're in where you continue to justify to yourself that you're gonna be able to beat this. You won't. That's why God's given you community. That's why God gave us light to shine into darkness. Well, what will people think? What's true about you and therefore what's true about Christ? That's what they'll think. You wanna rest? I've said this to you a bunch. There's few things as freeing as not having any secrets. There's few things as freeing as not having any secrets, not having to carry the weight of feeling like at any moment you're gonna get busted and be found out to be a fake. Now, many of us, that, that's gonna be a wrestle, right? It, it's gonna, we'll wrestle with it from time to time. But man, there's something beautiful about somebody walking up going, guess what I found out? And you're going, what? Without any, oh my gosh, what did they find out? There's a freedom there. Christ invites you in to that freedom.